Good evening. I'm Malcolm Young, Dean of Grace Cathedral. Welcome to the forum and thanks for joining us online. My guest tonight is the Reverend Dr. Megan Rohrer, Bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Megan is the first openly transgender pastor bishop in a mainline Christian denomination. They are an award-winning filmmaker, musician, and historian, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, and received an honorable mention as an unsung hero of compassion by wisdom in action with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. As we continue our exploration of the cathedral's themes of healing this year, we're going to be talking tonight about the healing that comes from being our best self and being larger than other people's fear. Megan, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I was I, I was looking at your um, picture as we were waiting in the music, and I was um, looking at the stained glass window behind, and I was I was wondering where that was taken. Was is is that from Grace Cathedral? Yeah, from right underneath the the, the Lutheran window. Yeah, yeah, under the Luther, cool. the Reformers. Yeah, the Reformers window. I love that. Just totally uh, made me smile when I saw it. You know, um, we've it's been extraordinary to me to just see how much international attention you've been receiving um, through through this whole adventure of becoming bishop, um, being installed at Grace Cathedral or in, in, in three weeks ago or so. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just the news stories that are just coming out around the world. Like, what stories are they telling, and um, what are you learning about the media from this whole experience? Yeah, there's there's been press everywhere from People Magazine to Good Morning America to, um, I think it was in Time maybe, um, and then kind of all around the globe in lots of different languages. And that, those have been fun. I always love the way Google Translate like um, shines a spotlight on how other, particularly like how the Lutheran World Federation is taking it. Um, because I know that with the the installation and ordination of of LGBTQ kind of bishops in the Anglican church, there was a little bit of a rift in some parts of the world kind of because of the ways agreements happen and um, meetings happen all in the same place and location. And I think the wonderful thing about the Lutheran church in terms of, of a trans person becoming a bishop is that we've been studying gender violence globally for the last like three to six years. And so for some countries that means they're still trying to study how women can have voice and vote and full educational rights in some of the countries. But then in other places like the United States and some others, it's about kind of the varied nuances of gender and how it can kind of stretch us. And so even my, I think my favorite was there was a quote from the like presiding Bishop of the Lutheran church in Italy. And his response was like, well, the Americans have always been kind of wonky. So this is not a surprise that they would do this <laughs> thing, right? Uh, so like I appreciated that there's kind of this reforming spirit that's still a part of the Lutheran church and this like, of course, they're doing a new thing because that's what Lutherans do. And so uh, thankfully, I think we're in a place where the Lutheran kind of world federation is kind of on board with with the idea that it's an election. It's for six years. Maybe it's because in the United States, we have elections sometimes where leaders serve for four years. And it's a little wonky sometimes. They're like, ah, we can outlive that or, or whatever happens next. Um, but my favorite headline was, I think, from last week. And it was a headline in Germany. And it just said, Bishop mit piercings. Bishop with piercings. And I thought, <laughs> that is hysterical. They totally skipped to like a different place. And I'm not the first Lutheran bishop with piercings. I'm sure there's um, many denominations with bishops with piercings. But I just thought that's a new... That's a new headline. I'd say oh, maybe yeah. Not a little bit. Yeah. And what did you learn about just media? Just, I mean, it, it does. I mean, it's, I'm so glad that you brought up uh, the ordination of Gene Robinson in New Hampshire mm -hmm. in 2003. I, I just remember so clearly just what that was like, but it was such a different media environment. Like, if someone said, I saw you on TV, no one sent me an email with the, the link to the TV program. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Whereas it's just, it's a very different scene now. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Well, I think what I have been noticing, maybe it's because I've been a chaplain for first responders for so long, but I think folk who work in the media have seen a lot of hard stuff and they've reported a lot of terrible things just over and over, over the last couple of years. And so overwhelmingly, almost every person who does a story about me 
needs a pastor. And that's why they're doing a story about me. Not whomever is watching this who's in the media, but other people. Um, and, and so it's been really interesting to see how much people have been delighted to have a story that is good news, yeah. right? And to try to translate good news into good news in all the places, which I think is the definition of what pastors ought to be doing. But it's been really, so it's been lovely to see how it's for the most part all been good news. And that means that people are more interested in like a rags to riches story of like, oh, it was so hard and now it's great. Um, and so right now I'm, I'm currently in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, visiting my alma mater, my um, Augustana University, because so many of the news stories just want to take there was a three month time period in my life when Matthew Shepard had died and when people were trying to, they thought I had gay demons and they would throw holy water on me and sing hymns. Yeah. Terrible time would not wish it on anyone. It is spiritual abuse. But if you take only those three months of college, you miss out on the fact that I'm only a pastor because when my home congregation said, we're not sure about LGBTQ pastors, the religion professors at my university said, will be your home congregation. They took it on themselves to educate the South Dakota area to like make it possible. And they kept writing theology about it. And so it's, I see it as there are hundreds of thousands of folk in the community of saints who have helped get us to this day. I just happen to be the person who got elected. And so tr what I'm trying to do, I think is balance off just that that idea that I got here alone because I'm special or the idea that I only had tough moments in my life because I think the 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 importance for me of doing a lot of media is I want people to be able to imagine their life as a trans person as faithful not just dangerous and I want their family to imagine that and I want legislators who write weird policies to be able to imagine that. And South Dakota is a place where that happens. So seeing someone in a purple shirt with a giant cross, right? And who is unapologetic, I'm an unapologetically Christian, but also unapologetically trans helps to kind of stretch people's creativity. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, so, but it's amazing to me how much even in stories that are positive, it's always that arc of, it was really terrible and only you could rise above and, you know. I really love that. And I can imagine just, it must be, I mean, just so delightful to be back at on campus again. And, I, yeah. and, and, and just seeing those places that meant so much to you during such a formative time in your life. I wonder too, if you could just talk about just like, what is your message for people? Like when you get up at the podium in a place like Augustana University in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, what do you say um, to, to kind of give people hope and, and help them to see themselves as spiritual beings and encouraged by God, et cetera? Well, one of my one of my former professors told me after I had preached and taught at a bunch of classes, he said, you know, what I like the most that you've done while you've spoken here is that you tell people you thought being a pastor was a dumb idea for a while, that you weren't sure that you could do it. Right. That my call story is more like Jonah than that, like song here. I am Lord. Right? So like, I can do this. Um, and I think that's because so many people when they're entering a brand new career are like, but can I do this? And then you get the diploma and you're like, but can I do this? And you, even if you get the right outfit or the right uniform, you're like, but can I do this? And I don't think that feeling goes away like even at an installation service I it was my favorite because the vergers would tell us where to stand because we were a bunch of people in fancy outfits who love God who had spent a lot of time on a liturgy but still need someone to sh like point us to the right spot to be because each of us still carried this but can I am I in the right spot can I do this right and thankfully God shows up no matter what we do on accident or on purpose that kind of screws the mix all up. But I think that's, that's for me, the beauty of this message. And then it's also like whatever way that your body has made other people wonder if God could love you hear someone, if it takes a title of Bishop to tell it to you to say that, no, nothing, neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come can ever separate you from God's love. And I don't care how often they said it. And I don't care in what font they wrote it. 
or how they enshrined it into legislation, but God doesn't give a crap about majority voting (laughs) when God's figuring out who to love. And so I think it's two things, right? It's being myself so that other people can live bravely into the embodiments that they carry, but it's also trying to be faithful consistently so that I outlast the fears other people have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. It, I, I feel sometimes like we're at the beginning of a, a very long journey um, and, uh, and, and what a delight is. I, I feel the same way as those, the, 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 the journalists who, who are looking to you as their pastor. Yeah. I'm just so delighted about, uh, about, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the election and what like that was like, 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 like leading up to it. Did you know that, that, did you have a sense that, that this would happen or like, like, how does it, how did, what was it like? Well, so my journey into like being willing to put my name for it in the in the bishop election began several years prior in Norway, where I was speaking at the St. Olaf Festival at a giant cathedral that had the courage to take out some of its pews so they could all do yoga and have a feast oh, day. I love it. I don't know if that sounds familiar. And then they had opera singers and dancers. Yeah. Um, but I so I was at this this cathedral where my Norwegian ancestors probably had been at some point. And on my way home, they put in the national Norwegian paper that I was a bishop and it was not true. And I was so embarrassed. I thought that people would think I had misrepresented myself or lied to people. And I just was so embarrassed, but I I'm been the kind of person where sometimes like, you know, the paper that gets an F is featured in Wittenberg, Germany on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation later. And so it's like sometimes the accidents and the mistakes are praised just on a different time frame. And so I was like, as, so as I'm flying home from Norway, I just had this moment where I just thought, wait a minute, all of Norway believes a trans person is a bishop now. Yeah. Right. And I thought about what it meant for all of the trans faith leaders that I had met, the deacons and the, and the, priests and to just think that like wow this one typo changed the world and but then I started wondering why don't I believe it I'm an I've been an out proud trans person for over 20 years but I don't think a trans person could be a bishop what's that about what maybe the Norwegians are right <laughs> maybe they are well they were just in the wrong in, time in right? your time exactly yeah. and so I went on pilgrimages so I went I visited the 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 site of my 16th great grandfather in Switzerland, who happens to be the patron saint of Switzerland. Wow. I know, common story. Saint Nicholas von Flew of Saxon, Switzerland. Oh, yeah, right, of course. Because I thought I've spent all this time in my life pondering my sinfulness because everyone keeps bringing it up. And so I've spent all this time talking about it, but I have not given equal time to pondering my saintliness. Wow. Right. And so I was like, so I need to spend equal time thinking about it. And I went to Germany and I, traveled through the places where Martin Luther had been. And there's this place, Wartburg Castle, where it's so dangerous for him to be himself. I want to go there so badly. Oh, you got to go. I got to right? see it. Tell me what it's like. So he gets he gets stolen away. He gets kidnapped he gets by his kidnapped. friends because it's too dangerous to be there. And he hides as this knight named George. And he transcribes the Bible. Yeah. He had 12 helpers, but that part's the less Wittenberg fun. Bible. I didn't realize he had 12 helpers. I'm glad you told he me had, that. He had like Hebrew scholars and he had Greek scholars. But what's beautiful about that is the work he did was to make a unifying German language because everybody ended up reading the Bible. So he took he took those literal translations and he made them poetry. I agree. He's the one who started using children of God instead of just sons of God. right. Right. So he starts changing the gender of stuff because he thinks. Well, you have to expand the possibility of who is loving in all of your translating, right? right? But so I just thought, well, maybe the journey of being a good Lutheran is that at some points you have to hide because it's too dangerous. And so maybe I'm on the right path, right? I love that too. Right? And he self-published like 300 books. So who cares how your books make it out in the world? Like just print them, like have the courage to push print. And so I just... I kind of psyched myself up. Then I appeared on Queer Eye. Oh yeah, right. On Netflix. And that, that. 
And it was filmed like a year earlier, but it came out in June during the pandemic and we didn't have much else to do during that time. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, oh no, I wonder if I just became popular. <laughs> <laughs> I had already committed that I was going to put my name in because I was like, I'm going to go on this journey and see where it takes me because this is like me putting my name in is believing that I could do it. And so as it started, I had, I had like 24 boats in the beginning and 24 then is what you started, with. started with 24 <laughs> and we started with like 24 people whose names were in there. It went down to seven and uh -huh. everyone got a five minute speech. Then it went to to three people who got to answer like seven questions for five minutes each. One of the questions was like something like, how will you end racism in our church and prevent the destruction of our planet from global warming? <laughs> five <laughs> minutes go, right? <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah. So you can't fully, so you do your best, right? Then it goes down to two and the final two get a five minute speech. And it was down to myself and Jeff Johnson. For those who don't know Jeff Johnson, he was one of the first gay pastors extraordinarily ordained by following the 1500s rules instead of the contemporary church's rules. And so he had, he was the actual person who signed my ordination certificate wow. yeah. when I was ordained extraordinarily. And he had been a bishop to me for all of these years kind of in this in this like lgbtq capacity so we knew one of us would be the bishop and and so it just was this moment of being like wow whatever happens will be amazing and then they took the last vote and dolly parton's light on a clear blue morning was sung by like a lutheran choir and yeah. <laughs> point harmony or something yeah. and then they announced the number of votes that you needed and Jeff had one less than that. And we were like, what? Wow. And I got the exact number of votes needed, 50% plus one to be elected, wow. which is brilliant, right? Because Jeff deserves really? every vote. And then every person afterwards has said to me, Bishop, I was that vote. I <laughs> That's great. I love and it. And I love it. Because how often when you go to church meetings and vote on something, do you feel like it mattered that you were there? And every single person who was a part of that vote is like, it was my vote. Right. Otherwise, we wouldn't have done this history thing, right? Because people think, oh, I'm the first trans bishop. No, they elected. They did the history moment. I just was there and willing to like put my name forward. And so I was told that if the one person had gone to the bathroom or something and not voted right. that the way we would have settled it because lutherans are strange is we would have flipped a coin no way because that's what i was just gonna guess i was gonna interject how amazing flip a i coin. think because they casted lots to see who would the who was yes, the disciple who got bias, to replace exactly Judas. of course that is exactly what they're thinking but can you imagine if it was like the first transgender bishop because of the coin flip <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious what about the weirdest it was so close that's amazing and it was wonderful because two yeah. extraordinary people you yeah. know um and what a what a testimony to just uh, our lutherans br brothers and sisters and siblings here in 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 northern california nevada and and yeah. and, and, and doing this tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a bishop you may not even have been a bishop long enough to know about it, but you're certainly learning a lot about it right now. Do, do they have like a bishop training course? Yeah. Yeah, we call it we call it baby bishop boot camp. Uh, good, good. And they give you a bishop mobile so you get a little car to drive around because it's cheaper to pay for the gas than mileage. And oh so um, there is there's like a three page job description in our constitution. And it's like everything from teaching and preaching. Like I decide what proper theology is in our geography, that's fun, I guess, to all the paperwork that goes with credentialing all the pastors. Oh, yeah, right. So overseeing the candidacy process and yeah. who is approved, giving advice to colleges. The good news, it doesn't say good advice, it just says giving advice, <laughs> right? And it's, and it's being an ambassador to all of our ecclesiastical partners and hanging out with other bishops. And, and we have sister synods, like so, we're in, I'm the kind of liaison to our sister synods in El Salvador and Rwanda and Taiwan and to um, speak on behalf of the church. The, the ELCA had made this pledge that they were going to try to grow by a million members by reaching out to people who were racially diverse, who had economic diversity, and who were LGBTQ. 
And so they were, their strategy was to be like, let's get in the papers supporting LGBTQ folks. So I think I did my part this year, <laughs> you at least you for did. the papers. Yeah. Have you, have you, your, your, your um, Bishop colleagues have been reaching out to you. I wonder if you can tell you, share any stories about what that's been like. And, and um... yeah, well, so the, I mean, the, the bishops reach out every week on Zoom, which is oh, fun. Yeah. And they're very tight because there's also all of this weird stuff that we do that is like handling misconduct and being principals and caring for victims of misconduct and overseeing what happens if a pastor has to be asked not to be a part of the ELCA anymore. And so there's a part of it that is very, very confidential, very serious and very yeah. hard work to carry. And so um, my experience is that all the bishops are very trusting of each other. They root for each other. They support each other. And it's always wonderful for me every time I'm at the, the check-in each week because when you have like a day that feels like the worst, terrible, no good, rotten day ever, there's always some synod somewhere where it's like worse. Right? <laughs> and so you get to sort of commiserate with each other, but also talk about the joys of it or, you know, the days where it feels like people like you too much. Like, oh, yeah, totally. I can imagine. What do you do with all the gifts that people give you? you yes. Oh my gosh. Completely. Where do you put them? Where do you, start? how do you catalog them? Like things yeah. like that. So it's, it's the joys, the joys and the tears. And um, I have been throughout my whole ministry archiving a lot of my things at the Gay and Lesbian Historical Society in San oh, Francisco. Cool. What a great so, idea. So I've had like, like back in the day when the Lutherans weren't quite ready for the LGBTQ pastors, I saved all my name tags from the synod assembly meetings where they wouldn't put the word reverend on it. And I had to write it in in Sharpie. Yeah. So there's year after year after year when they wouldn't put the word reverend on my name tag. Well, the next Senate assembly, I'm in charge of the meeting. So I went from being someone who wasn't allowed to vote. Yeah, completely. To to the, right? Yeah, yeah. So I might care too much about the name tags. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're a great part of history. I, I'm, glad, yeah. I'm glad that you saved those things. Because, yeah, they're so important to, um, to, to, to keep and, and pay attention to. Because we are living through just such extraordinary changes. And I wonder if you can just talk about that, just like, just like your childhood, like what it was like yeah. growing up in South Dakota and, and just, um, you know, just what kind of kid were you and, and how did your, how, we, how, what kind of kid you were has helped prepare you for all this as an adult, you know? Well, when I was six, my parents got divorced. My dad was a, an alcoholic and he destroyed like everything in our home. And I remember going into our home one time and I think we were like going in to check and see if there were any like toys left to like get your belongings and then like say goodbye to the house. And and I just remember having this profound experience of there just being like rubble everywhere, but knowing really palpably that God was with me and kind of having this sense of like this, this might be the worst day of your life, but here's the good news. Every day after today is going to be easier, right? And who knows if that's really true? Like there's a lot of hard things you can live through in life, but it's always for me been something where like death has not been a fear of mine because I feel like I got close to this moment where God just was like, I got you, like, it's going to be fine. And so I've always sort of had like this mystical connection that that is hard to explain. But what it has meant is that um, when other members of my family might have struggled with addiction or mental health issues or struggled with their faith, that I have always like felt like God was with me and I had enough to spare. So I would sometimes sneak to church and not tell my family I was going, even though they would have loved to have gone with me, but I just wanted to go by myself. And I, when we, when we traveled as a kid, I would, they had these little things you could take with you to get the stamp to show that you had perfect attendance and then you yeah. could like bring it back to your church. And so I was kind of nerdy. I liked hanging out um, at church, but also like my grandmother lives in a small town, Clark, South Dakota, population about 2000. If you count the people who used to live there too. <laughs> um, but her congregation, um, my grandma was the kind of person that like on Easter, when there was like a midnight mass and then like a sunrise mass 
and then like uh and then two more services for the regular services of the congregation my grandma would go to all of the services and act like she was upset <laughs> in her face she wasn't and she would say pastor take a nap i'm going to look so upset that no one will bother you and so she would like let the pastor take a nap during all of the coffee hour right <laughs> So I grew up with a, a family that not only enjoyed the like spiritual parts of church, but also the like, like thought having well church leaders was important. Right. And so, but I thought like, I don't, I don't need to be a pastor. It was a tough time. I graduated from college in 2001. And I just thought like, I don't want to have to be a superhero church person in order to be a Lutheran pastor. And um, but I, I was working at a, a shelter for uh, abandoned and neglected kids in South Dakota. And there was this kid who was six. He had tried to take his own life like 12 times and wouldn't tell anyone why. And he told me during like veggie tales or something that he wanted to die before he was so bad, he would have to go to hell. And I just told myself, like, even if I say nothing, it would be better than having there be a pulpit where someone's gonna say these kinds of things to kids. And so I drew, got in the car, drove more hours than you're supposed to, only stopped once on the drive from South Dakota to Berkeley and, and went to seminary and continued to care for the homeless and the hungry and to um, care for those who are on the margins and who are vulnerable and you know, continued to kind of do that same sort of like scrappy work, but yeah. then got to do it with you know, the signs and symbols of God in front of my voice box. Right, right, so right, it right, wasn't right. just me. Yeah. It's like an invitation too. And I, I think it's one of my, I, 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 I love your description of just like childhood faith. Cause yeah. I mean, that's what I love the most about just your whole approach. It's just, I, I think there's some people who just have just a very strong intuition and understanding about what, who God is and, and, and what God is doing in the world. And I feel like you really have that. I, I mean, I, I, you, you may not realize this, but I went to Lutheran catechism too. So, you know, during a period of my life, we lived closer to a Lutheran church than we lived to an Episcopal church. So um, for, for, for two years, I, I, I was in catechism and the first year was kind of like the old Testament year. And the next year was the new Testament year. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just like what catechism was like, like how the Lutheran church taught you when you were a kid um, and, and prepared you for confirmation. Well, I was a part of um, a group of kids who asked too many questions. So we weren't ever allowed to graduate. Oh, no uh, way. Yeah. So <laughs> it was supposed to be a one year program where you're supposed to like memorize the Lutheran catechism is set up with all these different questions. Yeah, and questions. the question is we like, well, why does this matter? And you could, and you were supposed to like memorize the questions and then you were done. But the group that I was in was just like, well, explain to us why Noah didn't try to rescue the rest of the world. Why was he so selfish? Explain to us why Noah wants to save everyone else in that town and doesn't give a crap about his family or his kid. Like all great rabbi questions, all great like pastoral leader questions. And so I just remember the, the head pastor being super mad that we wouldn't just memorize the thing and just refusing to graduate us. And then finally let us pass um, confirmation because he didn't want us to come back anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. Oh, it does take me back to, to yeah. confirmation. John Morin, I, I don't even know if you've ever known him, but he is the power pastor and just someone I just still admire so much. I, yeah, an extraordinary pastor. Um, yeah. Um, so um, are there ways in which your spirituality has evolved over time and changed? I, I, I kind of wonder about that too, because um, sometimes I, there are elements that, that are pretty much the same for me and things that are changing. I, I just didn't know, yeah. you know how, how you answer that question for people. Well, I think I still connect more to the hymns than to the out loud words oh, in yeah. worship service. Um, I feel like I've grown to love communion more over time. Like before I just, I, it was about the songs and maybe about the sermon, but um, I don't know if you know this about Lutherans, but we will sometimes add more prayer so we can sing another hymn. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, for me, it's about the sung parts. And um, and Luther always believed that that was the one moment where God showed up in worship when we synchronized our breathing. 
Right, yeah. right. I totally yeah. remember that now. Yeah. So good. Yeah. But I think over time, I think what, what became helpful for me is I think when I was in school, I felt like if I read enough books, I could explain it to other people, like why God was big and you couldn't make God small. And I feel like I felt the need to like try to shine a light on different Bible verses that would share that. And I think now that I've done more like chaplaincy stuff or more stuff with like folk on the edges of mental health issues, like a paranoid schizophrenic doesn't give a crap about any sort of rational description of God. And so I think what I have become maybe is more patient. Um, and because I, I think I trust more that God and I are good. So I don't need it to explain it to anyone. And I find that if I just apologize to people for the thing that they're afraid of or they're upset about, not because it's like my apology, but because if if I can speak the words that help someone move on or move out of anger and into joy or into Thanksgiving or into something else, that 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 for me is the community that that feels the most like the kingdom of God or more like God palpable in this earth. And so like there's something about those resurrection moments now where where it's not about the flesh and the bone, but it's about eating together and the sounds and the vibrating of the spirit. And so I feel just much more comfortable in the silence, in the not needing to fill the space um, and, you know, a good, a good labyrinth walk or um, watching my kids. One of my favorite things to do is to have my kids run through Golden Gate Park and then, um, and they make the path, right? Yeah. Thinking about how kids kind of view where they notice God in the world. And so I feel like it's it's less of a need to change or alter anyone else, but more of a desire to just like dwell with God and, you know, know that time is on my side, that forgiveness is going to happen. And it's yeah, all gonna it's all gonna be okay right yeah i love that i love that sense of patience and and, and just appreciation of silence too that um that that we don't have to do absolutely everything alan jones gave me a poem uh, like a month and a half ago it's like i've got a gift for you and it's a poem and basically that's what the poem is about it's just like we don't have to do everything it's not about us um, it, um it's about god and and god is the one in god's own time that yep. will, will, will be that agent of healing and, and reconciliation yeah. and and love. Well, that was part of, that was for me, part of the reason of like why it felt important to try to have the Bishop installation at Grace Cathedral is because I feel like the beauty of the building does the work for you. Yes, totally. Right? You don't have to overthink the liturgy. You don't have to overthink the music. Like the beauty of the room is going to work and it's going to, you know, you don't have to feel self-conscious that you're not worthy of God's attention in a room that worthy of God's attention, right? And wow. the room is so big that you also know it's not about you. You couldn't you couldn't be the centerpiece of that building if you tried, right? Wow. Wow. You're a tiny speck in it, just yeah. like we are just one, one part of kind of God's vision. And so I think there's something really great about pairing new things with traditional things and pairing, you know, getting gravitas and borrowing gravitas from the places it's already occurring rather than trying to invent it. You're so right about all of that. Uh, and I'm so glad to be reminded because I, I just never want to take that space for granted because I do, I just have a sense of God's presence in such a powerful way there. Um, you know, um, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just kind of like your, your journey as a trans person, too. And I, th I think that would be helpful for, for people that we have who, who, who might be seeing this in the future. Yeah. Um, you know, how has that been? Especially, like I said, I, I kind of made mention of this earlier, but just it, it's almost like, like the rules and people's perceptions are changing so much. And then you're in that whole system of figuring out how, how you know, where, where all this um, fits together into a harmonious whole, you know? So, so maybe you can tell us just a little bit about just what, what that's been like. Yeah, so I think there's many streams of it. And that's what I think is different than what people expect the trans experience to be like than what it maybe feels like to be in with and through it is 
I think some people believe that there's this sense where you just know a thing and your journey is about expressing that thing and then living into that thing, helping with maybe maybe the help of the medical community and maybe not the help of medical yeah. community. Well, even when, and, as you say that, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of aspects of human life that are like that. We, we have a, it's like a vocation is what Luther always talked about, mm -hmm. but having a calling in, in that yeah. way. Yeah, I think it's, but like puberty is a funny thing, right? There's all these books like, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, because we all want to be in control about what happens when we go through the door of puberty. And I think most people go through it twice. You go through it um, in your teenage adolescence years, and then you go through it later in life when you pause from some of that stuff and you and your hormones shift again. And so trans people are just simply people who who probably still just have those two puberty times. They just do it out of sync with their peers, right? So it's a little more awkward, a little more unexpected. But what I find for some folk, because many parts of the transgender journey are unjust. And so like many states require a trans person to have a medical doctor verify that they are entirely infertile before you can change your driver's license or your birth certificate, right? Or before you can uh, go on to a different stage of prescriptions or ways of being in your body. And what that means is, is that for some people, you might change your pronouns at one period in your life when you think you're ready for the world's dealing with changing your pronouns. You may or may not change your name at a different period in your life, but everybody changes their name. Like, you know, someone who was Mikey might want to be Mike at some period in their life. And they want the person who's their intimate partner to have a special name for them. And maybe they have a name they want God to call them. And so we all have these ways that our names transition over time. But if I don't know, for some people, it seems different because it's because it's a trans experience. We all have different ways we dress in different periods of our life for different jobs, different, different holidays, maybe for different you know, you might dress up for church, you might not dress like the way that you put uniform and clothing on, it shifts in different parts of your life. It might be different when you want to project something to other people, whether that's finding a mate that you want, or it's expressing something in the workplace. Even and so, protest march, you, you, you may want yeah. to express a certain, you know, absolutely. Thing. Yeah. So the journey, I think, is multi layered, because it's what am I going to wear? How do I want to be treated? Who am I going to tell about my private parts, which should be very few number of people yeah. in my estimation? Um, who am I going to talk to about my personal medical decisions and about what prescriptions I take, which also often should be allowed to be just a, a few people? Um, and how am I going to like ask other people to treat me and to, to name me in the world? And because folk who want to go from one spot to a much farther away spot have to lose their fertility, that's a real lifelong journey for some people. So you could make a different choice for now than is who you would like to be. And so I think I just share the different pieces of that because I think there is this idea that it's like this. Right and, right. and partly that's because in order to get medications, trans people figured out a story that right. works to get you medications and they wrote it in newsletters and shared it with each other. And so that's what we tell our doctors so that you can do the thing. But in our own company, we're talking about the, 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 the way changes are strange and unusual, the way your smell changes if your hormones change, the way your texture changes, the way your pheromones and your desire might change, the way that you read and how you feel and your access to your feelings can change and shift. And so I think of, I think of being trans as being on a pilgrimage. Right. You might think, you know, how it's going to feel yeah. and what you're going to do and what you're going to wear. But then you show up and you're it's smellier in your thought. And it's, you know, it's no one else was wearing traditional garb in that country. Right. Like, so it's 
you it's kind of a let's see where this goes kind of thing rather yeah, than it's very helpful to you yeah. i think I, I was at a i was at a board meeting for a school on monday night and the the board chair wrote a little note about the difference between like a kind of a conversion in an instant and sanctification over time yeah. and I, I i there is i i don't i think maybe that the, the desire for that conversion is people like to see things in black and white terms and and that story that you tell of like being on a pilgrimage um it's just not very satisfactory to people who but that's what real life is i just feel like yeah. it's like real life is so much more like a pilgrimage than an instantaneous conversion yeah people want to know how to make uncomfortable things less uncomfortable and the the truth is is that our bodies are always changing and shifting that very few of us look in a mirror and think all of our flaps and folds are where we want them to be or where they used to be. And if we live long enough, we will all become more and more disabled. Yeah. And rather than name that, I think sometimes we think, oh, but if I just am on the treadmill enough, I can stay this off. And maybe that's true. God bless you if that's your thing. But, um, but I think that there is a way in which trans people might have some insight into dwelling in those in-between spaces, between life and death, between male and female, between um, comfort and discomfort with your body. And so there is a, a way in which trans community allows people to say things out loud that they might not otherwise have said. So I think trans people are more likely to tell you what their food issues are mm. because they're in touch with what's going on in their body and they're gonna share it. Trans people might be a little bit, um, more in touch with the ways that their brains are neurodiverse. There's something that says that for some high functioning autistic people or on the Asperger's spectrum, maybe as many as 70% are trans, mm. right? And it's just people who are dwelling in some in-between spaces. And I can tell you how I identify today. I can't tell you how I'm gonna identify in five years, like, because I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. That's so helpful, Bishop Megan. I, I yeah. just think for um, you're you're so dialed into that the, the the community's conversation about these issues, and it's it's just so helpful for 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 me in particular to yeah. to hear. I wonder if there are certain kind of like almost like stages where like you know where that that pilgrimage where you're you're facing different kinds of questions where it's like a more pronounced thing. Like I, I definitely talk to young people and I like your 20s is a time when you're really figuring out like who you're going to be, what you're going to stand for, what your values are going to be. But I wonder if just it, um, if there are any special milestones just, you know, as you were kind of after you hit puberty and you're getting, start, starting to grow and mature, which, which were um, milestones that, that are, that are, that are for, for other people who are trans people too. Yeah, I think some of the milestones um, are, I think there are a few moments for some people's trans journey where you cross your threshold, you can't uncross. Well, you can, but it's expensive and it takes a lot of things, yeah. right? And so I think anytime you intentionally scar yourself in a way that will have scars forever, that's a threshold you're not going to be able to walk back. Um, your body just has changed kind of in a permanent way. Anytime you cross a, a pheromone threshold where there's kind of a moment of just jumping in with all feet and seeing what happens next, like there's a way in which like you could stop taking testosterone, but it's not like your hairline's gonna come back, right? And so there are some places that are kind of all in moments. For some people that's, telling their family pronouns because it's a even if people's identities shift and change or the ways they identify themselves shift and change or go in a circle or come backwards it changes this idea that other people knew you as fully as they thought they did right so because if there is a thing about your identity you have to have a family meeting about yeah. the part that shakes your family isn't isn't always fears about an identity or whatever happens next. It's, it's really the sadness and the grief of, oh crap, I thought I knew you. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm learn learning a new thing. And now I have to start over and get to know you. And so I think there is a lament that families have that regardless of where they are in LGBTQ issues, it's just when we are reminded 
that we don't fully know people we love makes us sad. Yeah. You know, the other flip side of it is like, I, it's funny because you're bringing me back to a conversation that I had, it must have been 20 years ago with Cameron mm -hmm. Partridge. So mm -hmm. um, Cameron Partridge, uh, Cameron Partridge's family was in the church that I was serving when I was first ordained. And mm -hmm. so I've known Cameron since Cameron was a teenager, mm -hmm. I think. I mean, since early 20s at least. But I remember Cameron talking to me about trans trans issues and explaining everything uh, mm -hmm. in such a, it, so carefully and so thoughtfully. And, and I think um, that's part of it too, is that um, there is a, a kind of gift of communication and realizing that from those hard conversations, you you learn a kind of skill um, mm -hmm. that that's a just a huge gift. I mean, it's what human beings need to do. We need to be able to connect with each other on a deeper and more profound level, and to be able to experience each other with empathy and love. And and it's so interesting as you were t describing that. I was just thinking that's what you're doing slightly for me right now is what I got a lot of from Cameron twenty years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. And trans people biblically are in those threshold places. Like, like there used to be eunuchs at every doorway to be able to communicate messages to the king or to communicate between life and death. Or men would have, have a, a gender, gender diverse person who would be their main communicator when they wanted to share a message to the women. And all the paintings we have of the empty tomb, the messenger who's sharing the news to the women is beard, a beardless adult male right? Who's dwelling in those in-between spaces. And so there's so many lovely people throughout the biblical texts that are able to do that, like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and the Ethiopian eunuch. And just, it's so many, it's, it's hard to name them, but this idea that dwelling in those in-between spaces can help translate God to humans or, and, and can translate across the gender spectrum. I think it's such a beautiful a beautiful place to include people who are diverse in gender. Yeah, I'm so glad. I, I remember in like 1994 hearing um, Stuart Barnes was the um, chaplain at Harvard College, and he was talking about the the healing of the centurion's um, slave, and yeah. said, "You know, I think there's more going on. I think the two of them were were, were lovers, mm -hmm. and and it, so it's, you're right. And all of a sudden." You, you go through the Bible, and it, it, I love what you just did was mm -hmm. to open up those moments where, where the Bible is going to mean something completely new to us, yeah. and God's going to speak to us in a completely new way as a result of this new social change that we're experiencing, mm -hmm. um, or cultural change, I should say. I mean, it's yeah. yeah, but I used to think that Jesus was psychic, that he could oh, yeah. walk along the shore of Galilee and pick which of the people in well, both again, it's like who touched by robes, you know, right? But yeah. But instead, he's he's looking out at the people in the boats, and and you weren't supposed to sow if you were a man. So the fishermen would come back to shore if their nets were broken, and the, the scripture says they were in their boats sowing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Jesus goes, those people look like they could tr transgress some stuff with me. And for the Last Supper, he finds the one man in all of Jerusalem who's willing to do women's work and go to the well, right? So there's all these places where there is this seeking out of people who live in gender curiosity or in gender mischievous places and and I just love that God's up to some unusual stuff that will make people be like yeah but wow okay if God can use that person if God if if Jesus can celebrate the last meal at that person's house maybe I can go to that person's house or it just it just kind of breaks open the possibilities of who are the other people we didn't notice in this text Right, right. I just absolutely love that. It's so brilliant. Now, you know, when those texts come back to me, I, which was all the time, I, I'm, I'm going to have a chance to see them in this new way. You know, um, one of the things I did that was the most, one of the most embarrassing things around your um, installation was I misgendered you in a tweet. And so oh. the, the, the ELCA got right back to me, let me know. And I was, I was glad to hear from them because I, I want to make sure that everything's right. But I wonder if you have advice for people who are, you know, who, are, who, who want to be, make sure they're using the right pronouns. And then I also want, to, um, that's the first question. The second question is more about, you know, how do you it, it express to people how, why that's so important, you know? Yeah, so I have transgender black children. So it's important because 
my kids will cry for a week when you use the wrong pronouns for yeah, them. Yeah. And right. So I, because I grew up in a time and a place where it was not within my expectations that people would gender me in the ways that I was hopeful for. I have learned to just do my work yeah. and I really not notice, right? Right, right? Because if I correct someone's pronoun when I'm a pastor, I'm, I have now made that person feel anxious or embarrassed or like they need to care for me. And my role as the pastor was to care for them. And so most often I don't notice, but I am appreciative when people kind of are like working it out. My suggestion is practice on someone like me for whom it doesn't feel like a, a paper cut or something like that to be able to have my pronouns askew. If you're going to apologize, do it in private or in a forum where it's educational rather than in a place and then in a place where that trans person has already self-disclosed that they are trans. Because otherwise, I've also experienced a lot of weird moments where people apologize so much in a weird way that yeah. it makes me uncomfortable as a trans person that they've drawn a lot of attention to stuff that I didn't choose to in that meeting. And so, you know, when it's not appropriate to apologize in public, apologize in private, just once. You don't have to do it a thousand times. Do your best. Say things with kindness. Anything said with kindness, most people are going to see your heart. Um, and you can, I can tell the difference when someone's misgendering me on purpose than someone's misgendering me out of joy because their thumbs work too fast, right? Yeah. And so... <laughs> I think we have to practice because there are people for whom these words are life and death. Yeah. That the belief that the world can figure out how to say them, they, them in a sentence is what they are using as their barometer to whether or not they're going to take their life today. And so until people have more of a safety blanket or a legislative blanket or more faithful places where they can be cared for, then I think we have to do our best to be publicly supportive, intentionally supportive, explicitly supportive, not just about gender stuff, but about all of the racial diversity we want to see in the world and the ways that, that our scaredness about our body might be rooted in some of those Christian teachings of Paul not liking himself and giving unsolicited advice to others without any sort of counter narrative printed, right? Wouldn't it be great if we had the responses to I all agree. That's what I keep And they were just like, thank again. you, but mind your own business. And Completely. by the way, I don't take parenting advice from someone who doesn't have kids, but thanks, <laughs> Paul. Brand new convert to yeah, Christianity. Totally. Right? Lovely, beautiful writing. I love his writings, particularly the ends of the letters. But like, how great would it be if the Maccabean grandmas got to write a response? Oh, I agree. You've been living this longer than you, buddy. Completely. Right? I love yeah. that idea. So um, one of the things I've been thinking just a lot about, just as, like just about social media. I mean, um, I don't know what, what, what you're noticing. I mean, Facebook was closed down, um, you know, for that whole day. And, you know, yeah. there's been a lot of debate of just about, you know, what, what, how is it good? How is it not good? I wonder if you can just talk about just, just like social media's usefulness for doing ministry. Um, and then also just kind of what are some of the shortcomings that you might see um, in terms of social media. I appreciate social media because it means that people around the world who don't have affirming family members or affirming people are able to reach out to role models or reach out to people for prayer. I get prayer requests from all over the world, um, but I also get people texting me saying, I chose to stay alive today because I figured out that you exist. Mm -hmm. And so I think being present and palpable is important. Um, I think showing up is important. As long as there are people living in spaces where they don't hear actual good news on a Sunday, they can go to their local church and have communion with them. But if they want to hear life affirming ministry, they sometimes have to, you know, tune into the live stream at Grace Cathedral and see what they're up to in San Francisco, because it's not going to happen in the middle of Montana or wherever they are. And so I think there is a beauty to being able to connect on a, on a larger scale. Um, but there is a danger when we put too much of our time and energy and intention into apps that are designed to be addictive, right? Addiction is hard. Addiction is tough. And I don't know that 
church should try to be addictive. And so that's my big caution is that if there is science and study into making these, making people come back and click more in an addictive way, that maybe it's fine if we're not good at that. Yeah, yeah, I like that. That's really good. I mean, one of the things I've been just um, seeing so much of people lately is just just COVID. Um, it, it just I, I, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about what the COVID experience was like for you, and and you know how you think things are changing. Keep it. People tell me this every day. They say it won't go back to being bef- like it was before. We're not. It's not going to be normal. But but I still don't really know what that means yet. So maybe you can talk to me a little, a little bit about what your thoughts are, and just in terms of how things are different and um, what we've learned through this whole pandemic experience. Well, so I was a chaplain in San Francisco Police Department at the time of the pandemic, and I um, started a community chaplaincy program that would care for folk all through San throughout San Francisco at the request of first responders. So during a time when people couldn't go to the hospital um, and social workers didn't go to people's houses, I got called out a lot to do a death notification, to tell a family that their loved one had died and be the only in-person person person that they were gonna have grief support with. Um, We provided chaplaincy care um, for medical examiners who have had a tough time during this pandemic. I've hugged a lot of firefighters and cared for people through grief and death. And there was a period of time where we weren't sure if when we left the house, we were gonna stay alive. And, but it felt like doing that grief work for those who were showing up for others was really important. And so me being that close to death, being willing to like do ministry that might kill you is a, is a way of touching back on what I experienced when I was six that like, death is is not a thing I need to fear and and God will be with me through that journey. And so um, I remember the first time I got to leave my house for life rather than death. And that was to see the new vaccination center at Moscone where they were oh. going to have 10,000 people a day get vaccinated. And I remember just weeping that I, that life was happening. And so we have moments where we get to go outside. Um, but for me, it's just such a joy to be in community because when it is life that is abundant even if it's the life of the people who are grieving together at a funeral there is something about it that feels better than waiting for death which is what parts of the pandemic felt like and so I think I'm kind of grateful things won't go back to the way that they were because I think God always existed everywhere and we just maybe only looked when we were in beautiful sanctuaries or maybe too often we didn't have live streams for the people who were homebound or unable to be in church spaces. And so I hope that that this pandemic gets us back in touch with the important the importance of life, the importance of having beautiful things around us, the importance of eating well and caring for ourselves, the importance of checking in on our neighbors, the importance of being a city and all the things we think cities ought to do, right? And that all of the other like nonsense that wasn't ever an emergency, but we thought was like, I've had, you guys I'm sure never would do this, but we've had too many meetings about who didn't sort the trash properly that lasted longer than just sorting the trash ourselves. Yeah. And so I hope it orients us towards remembering what real emergencies are and centering beauty and hope and love and and just shouting from the rooftops that God is good yeah. and God is in the sunset and God is in the birds and and all of those things because you know God God shows up for us even when we shelter yeah yeah Oh, it's so beautiful. That's such a such a wonderful way of looking at it. You know, um, I, I I totally can't believe this because I've got about fifteen more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like I just barely scraped the surface, but our time is we're run we've run out of time. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about things that are um, just signs of hope that you see around these days, um, just in in your experience. Yeah, so I have a seven and a nine year old. And they are the most joyful little bundles of black beautifulness um, that ever were bundles of joy. And I think they have a twinkle of life in their eyes, like this ability to transition and transform in ways that we never thought that they could have. And they 
kind of keep me chugging along in a way that remembers that, you know, morning cuddles can change a whole day that, um, like, my kids can have the worst day ever, but if you give them pancakes, it doesn't matter. Like they won't even remember. And so I just, I've been really kind of dwelling in that, dwelling in in the, the poetry um, that appears on sidewalks and from str- some from spray paint. Um, I've been dwelling in, in fabulous drag life and glitter sparkles in the Castro as people figure out how to like lip sync with face masks on and, I just think there is this generous creativity that that flows throughout San Francisco and throughout faith communities that is calling us to figure out the ways that we're going to pull together in beautiful ways. And that having the AIDS quilt up at the cathedral right now, for me, is a great reminder that we haven't figured out yet the art that is going to help us heal in this pandemic, right? right? right. Every tragedy in our history has some sort of piece of art that helps us figure it out and maybe it's sewing like the slaves did when they were telling their stories to each other and maybe it's um I don't know maybe it maybe it's um ribbons out windows or something but but we haven't figured the art out yet and so I'm hoping I'm hoping that that maybe the cathedral has a little space for some giant communal art to help. I love that. And basically what you're offering all of society, the whole global community, a challenge, which is yeah. let's, let's think creatively about what this experience that we've gone through together yeah. um, could, could be in, in the artistic world. What a great way. Found our thing, right? Like candles in the wind when Princess Diana died. Like yeah, what's it going to be? Will it be? Maybe it's ballet, maybe it's, I don't know, right? Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I feel like it's coming. So much beautiful art came out of the AIDS crisis and ACT UP that I know it's coming. Yeah. I'm just, I'm curious what it will be. Yeah, me too, me too. Well, um, it's been such a pleasure having you. Um, Please join me next week when my guest will be journalist and rhetoric scholar, Linda Kinsler. We'll be talking about artificial intelligence and faith. We rely on your support for the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can give to gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK, T-H-I-N-K, to 76278, 76278. And Megan, thank you so much for for being with us today and uh, interrupting uh, your important visit back at the uh, Augustana College. Um, It's such a pleasure to spend this time with you. And you're right, you brought so much good news into the world um, and we're so grateful and um, we're looking forward to seeing all the things that you accomplish over the years and years to come. And also with you. All right, thanks for watching. Yep, peace be with you.